almost as difficult as mastering the minutiae of atomic matter and antimatter is mastering the means to teach these things to an audience of minimally motivated public school students. Professor Mills draws on literary metaphor, slapstick comedy, and Mr. Wizard-like magical tricks. Abracadabra. Gone. Oh, oh, wow, you don't believe it. It's there, it came back again. Anyway, it, it went up my sleeve. You can't make things disappear. On the other hand, you can't prove that you can't make the things disappear because you have to try everything, and that's what people spent their lives doing in the uh, Middle Ages, making up magic words and trying to make things disappear. But finally, people have given up, and they've decided it's a law. There's a rule. Things don't disappear. And the summary of that is, is to say that there are conservation laws. I wrote the word conservation laws there. That, what that means is nobody's ever seen anything disappear into nothing, even though this morning you may have lost your socks and your mother screamed at you and you said they've disappeared. You know they didn't really disappear. If you look hard enough, they're under your bed or something. But sometimes a proton can turn into a neutron and it has to get rid of its charge. And when it does, it makes a positron. And that's the antiparticle of the electron. OK, next. So now I'm going to show you my first demonstration so that you wake up. I'm going to show you that you can bend positrons from a radioactive source the opposite direction that you bend electrons. OK, now I've got these, these two pieces of tungsten there that are going to define a beam. See, So when I move the detector in front of it, it only counts in front. Now I'm going to put the detector at the side. And now I'm going to see if I can deflect. I'm going to deflect the beam of po positrons. So when the blue is up, when the blue part of the magnet is up, it, it deflects it a little bit the other way. When the yellow part is up, it goes this way, right? You got that? So yellow up goes to your left, right? But without flipping the magnet, the electrons go the other way, right? So that proves that the positrons have the opposite charge to the electrons. I have here two photon detectors. This red one over here, which has a photomultiplier attached to a sodium iodide crystal. And on the other side is a similar one. I think that's about in the middle. Now notice there's no cover on the, on the source. This source is covered with very thin foil, so the positrons are all getting out. And hopefully, if I put, I have two pennies here. I'm going to uh, held together with a piece of tape. If I put them over it, it will keep the positrons localized so that the counting rate between the two detectors should increase. I think you will agree that the counting rate increased. Now, the, the real thing I want you to see is say this is a region inside somebody's body that we're trying to find out if it's sick or not. So if I move this over a little bit, the counting rate stopped. That is because it almost stopped. There's always, a, there's always exceptions. Anyway, um, that's because the two photons that you get when the positrons and electrons disappear are back to back in opposite directions, exactly. Now if I take my little brick here and put it in front, this counter is counting less. It, do it doesn't count them. So both counters have to count at the same time. If I put it on the other side, the same thing happens. And that is the end of my lecture. Thank you for your attention. In the end, he hopes all the students are at least intrigued by the marvels scientific investigation can offer. And it would be a triumph if one or two of these students might ultimately alter the direction of their lives by beginning to consider atomic physics a worthy realm for their imaginations to roam. <laughs>